Good morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? Man, I am so excited to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, we're, yeah, that's a good song, ain't it? Uh, we were practicing this morning, rehearsing, getting ready for everything, and then I just, uh, I just want us to take a moment, like we did as a team this morning, to focus on the words that we're singing this morning. Uh, it's it's very very easy to just sing these songs and just kind of get along and never actually listen to the words that we're singing. Never give our chance ourselves a chance to believe the words that we're singing, or to ask ourselves, do we really believe this? So this morning we're going to praise our God. That's why we came here, right? We're going to praise the character of our God. And I don't often do this, and I didn't do it in first service. I'm going to tell you what I said is this morning. You know, we're going to start out with Reckless Love. And that song is all about the character of God and the immense love that he has for us. That there's no place that we can hide there's no shame that we can have. There's nothing that we can go through that God is not coming, that God is not right there with us through it. And then we're going to move into a song called Make Room, which we've done a few times here before. And I really want us to dig into that song. Because life is hard. Life can be so hard. And it can get so busy. And we can have all these things in our lives that distract us from what really matters. And I want us to take the time this morning to commit to let God have everything inside of us and take control of every single thing inside of us so that he can do whatever he wants to with it. He can do with it whatever he wants with our lives. And we are committing to him this morning that we're going to make room in our hearts for him to do that. And then we're going to finish with probably, uh, I guarantee it's in one of my top three favorite worship songs right now. It's called Waymaker. And I know we've done that one. And I know we love that song here. Because that song speaks directly to the incredible, incredible character of our God. God can make a way where we don't see a way. God gave us promises through all of Scripture and he is a keeper of his promises. We know that. We've seen that. God is our promise keeper. And this morning, I don't know if any of you are in a dark place or going through something rough that seems like there's no way out of it. But that song says that our God is a light 
in our darkness. That is who our God is. So this morning as we praise and worship the character of our God, please, church, pay attention to the words that we're singing. Would you stand as we worship together?
cannot be the only one that feels God here. When you think and you sing about God's character and you praise him for that, this is what happens, church. He fills this room with his spirit. And when we sing about the character of God, that he's a way maker, a promise keeper, 
a light in our darkness. We get to sing the next words of this song. Because when we trust in who God is and the character of God, then no matter what's happening, we know that God's working. We have the authority to know that God is working. Even when we can't see him, even when it doesn't feel like it, God is working. Let's sing about it, church. Come on, you got to believe this. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. your name. We worship your character. Because for some reason or another, you descended from glory. You sent your son to pay the price for us. You made a way. And even though you're the God that has all control and all power, what you want most is a relationship with us. I don't understand it, but God, I'm so grateful for it. And God, I know that we may not always see you working, but we declare this morning that we know you are. And this morning, we want to make room for you in our lives to do whatever the heck you want to. God, make us uncomfortable. Strip things from our lives that don't need to be there. Make us look like you a little bit more every single day. Take our religious stuff and our traditions 
and what we think things should be like. Throw those out the window, God. Form us in your image. God, we're making room for you this morning. We're making room for you. We know that you're running after us. We know that you want to be there. So God, this morning we take everything that we have and we give it to you, God. We give everything we have to you so that you can change us. So that we can look more like you. We can look more like the God that sent his son and wants a relationship with us. God be with us this morning. We can feel your presence in this room. God, I pray for the word that you've given Pastor Rob. The basics of the gospel, the basics of who you are. And I know, God, that if we listen to those words, there's no way that we can't realize that you are God. There's no way we can't see your love for us in this. God, be with us this morning. Fill our hearts and our minds with you and only things of you. And may we carry that out into our lives. May our lives reflect you and you alone. We're so grateful for who you are. We love you and we praise you. In Christ's name, amen. everybody welcome to ncc online my name is pastor rob thank you for being with us today and if you're just checking us out for the first time i hope that you come and check us out in person when you can if you'd like to do that we'd love to meet you in person or if you're not local uh, we're just so happy that you're able to connect with us this way we were in a series called when necessary it comes from a quote preach the gospel at all times when necessary use words we've been talking a lot about how it is necessary to use our words to fulfill the great commission of Jesus Christ. It's not NCC's commission. It's not uh, just the church commission. It's actually God's commission to send us out into this world, to share with our lifestyle, to share with our good works, to share with uh, everyone we know, and also to share when necessary with our words. And so we thought it very important to have a succinct, gospel message really for two reasons one if you don't know christ that you would take the opportunity to watch through today's message and if you want to go back and listen to part one last week if you haven't and consider for yourself whether these claims are true because if they are it's of eternal significance literally it means eternal life or eternal death and we care for you god cares for you i hope that you receive christ as your lord and savior and the other big reason why we wanted to share the gospel in a succinct, concise way is because we're trying to help all of our church to have a good framework to share with other people. You may already have that. This would be a great refresher. But if you don't have that, I would actually ask you to consider uh, putting this to memory so that you will have an answer when people ask you for the hope that you have or when God gives you a great opportunity that just opens up a door to share your life with someone. And you are able to share in a way that is personalized, but is, is really good and true to what the scripture teaches. Here's the graphic we've been using. It's the gospel, life in six words. We've been using an acronym that we got from Dare to Share Ministries. Want to give them credit. G-O-S-P-E-L helps you to remember it. Last week, we looked at the bad news. It starts good. God created us to 
be with him. That means to have a relationship with him. He loves us. He made us in his image. We have immense worth. He stamped on us value. We saw in the $100 bill and the $1 bill that there's different values that are attached to the image, whether it's a Franklin or a Washington. Well, God says, well, I can top that. I'm going to stamp my own image onto humans so that they have immense worth and that they are made a little bit like me. Not that we're gods or, or that we are God, but we are like God in that we can have free choice. We can have free will. We can have decision making. We can have our emotions. We, we can be creative, but mostly so that he could have a relationship with us. It was a good creation. It was, uh, in a sense, perfect creation. There wasn't sin in the world. But then we see that our sins came and separated us from God. The devil in the form of the serpent came along. We see it early in the book of Genesis. He, he deceives Adam and Eve. They eat the forbidden fruit. And when they do, sin and death and shame and guilt enter the seed forever. And, and, it, and it warps everything. It, it corrupts their lives. It, it breaks their relationship with God. And it brings death into world, the world for the first time. And it's not what God wanted, but he also wanted them to have the freedom to be able to morally choose. And they fell for Satan's deception. And then we see that our sins cannot be removed by good deeds. So important as part of the good news message, because as humans, we're, we're all trying to bury our sins, our shame, our guilt with some other kind of behavior. Usually it's to try to get more good deeds then we have bad deeds. And I think many people, even believers, fall for the trap that if I do enough good, then God will accept me. But the Bible is unique. Christianity is alone and say, no, it doesn't work that way. And so we want to move into this powerful part, the good news today, and move into the next three. And as we do, would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for everyone listening in online. Thank you for the good news you've given us. I'm so excited to share it today, and I pray that you would use me. You would speak clearly. You would speak through your word, the power of your Holy Spirit, all glory to you and none to me, that anyone listening would receive your good news, and if they've already received it, that they would learn even better how to communicate it to others. We're, we're so excited about what you're going to do in this year, 2022, in our church, in our locality, as <coughs> everyone shares what you're doing in their lives in the good news gospel. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So here's the P. We're on the G-O-S, now we're on the P. Paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. We saw last week, we ended on a cliffhanger. We ended with some tension because the arrow was pointing to Jesus, but we hadn't quite talked about Jesus. But you could see, something has got a gift because no matter how good we are, uh, even our righteousness, the Bible says, is like filthy rags. But First Peter 3.18 says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. The righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. So Jesus enters the scene. He's God the Son. He takes off his immortality and takes on mortality by becoming a human. God so that he could die for us. He lives a perfect sinless life. He teaches the message about the kingdom of God. And he's on mission to die in our place. He dies on the cross and he resurrects from the dead. Hallelujah. Isaiah 53, 6 says this way, the prophet looking forward to what Jesus would do. He says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him, on Christ, the iniquity of us all, the sins of us all. So we see in this verse a powerful sacrificial substitute of Jesus, the Lamb of God. That someone had to die, someone had to pay the penalty for these sins. It was either going to be me or it was going to be someone else. And to pay for all the sins of all the world, it had to be God himself. So God comes, he dies for our sins, he takes our place, he takes our punishment, he takes death upon himself. And when he does so, he takes all the sins of the world. Think of this verse this way. Keep that verse up, Isaiah 53, 6. Imagine my tablet is our sin. And on this hand, you have myself, or it could be yourself. And on this hand, we have Christ. We have our lives, and we have the life of God. So it says, we all like sheep have gone astray. That's us. We, we, we go our own direction. We do our own thing. We've rebelled against God. We don't listen to the commandments. 
Each one is turned to his own way or her own way. And that's why we have this weight of sin on us and let this tablet represent our sin. But then it says something incredible. The Lord laid on him, here's Christ, he laid on him the iniquity of us all. And look what happens. I'm free and clear. I'm left sinless, guiltless, shameless, no shame, no guilt, no sin, clean, forgiven when I receive the truth about Christ. And God takes all of that iniquity, all of that sin, all of that weight, all of the things that separate me from having a relationship with him and puts it on his son, Jesus. Now, we have to think about what that means for Jesus himself. Martin Luther wrote this. All the prophets did foresee in in spirit that Christ should become the greater transgressor, murderer, adulterer, thief, rebel, blasphemer, etc. that ever was or could be in all the world. For he, being made a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, is now an innocent person and without sins but a sinner. So in other words, Jesus, of course, is sinless, but when he receives all of the sin, in a, in a sense, he becomes the adulterer, the abuser, the murderer, Martin Luther says, because he's taking everything that we did upon himself. Of course, he buries it on the cross and he dies for the, for the sin of all the world. That's what we celebrate when we have communion or the Lord's Supper. And he paid for all of those sins by his blood, by shedding his blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So God himself shed his blood for our forgiveness. In the book, Written in Blood, Robert Coleman tells this story. It's the story of a little boy and his sister. And they are having a pretty good life. But at one point, uh, the sister realizes she has a very rare disease that has to do with her blood. And she needs a transfusion. And the only person that has the right blood type to give it to her that's available is her brother. And they're both kind of little. They don't exactly know what's going on. But the doctor says to the boy, John, he says, John, would you be willing to give your blood to Mary? She needs this transfusion. Of course, he means some of her blood. And if, if you do that, we can, we can, we, she can live and, and, and she can go forward. John smiled and said, sure, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that for my sister. And soon the Two little children are, are wheeled into the hospital room. They're getting ready for this transfusion. Ma- Mary's pale and thin. John is robust and healthy. Neither spoke, but they looked at each other, and John smiled at his sister, Mary. But as the nurse inserted the, ed- the needle into John's arm, his smile faded, and he looked like he was getting nervous, and he was watching the blood flow through the tube. And when the ordeal was almost over, his voice now a little bit shaky broke the silence. And he said, doctor, when do I die? And only the doctor at that moment realized that John misunderstood. He thought he was sacrificing his life by giving all of his blood to his sister. And he was fretting because it was just a matter of time before his life was taken from him. Now, he was willing to do it. He was willing to die for his sister, to give up all of his blood so she could live. And in that, Coleman says, is a little glimpse of what Jesus did for the whole world, that he willingly willingly went to the cross, that he willingly gave us a blood transfusion, but not just for one of us, for the sins of the whole world. The great hymn writer Philip P. Bliss said it this way, Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Jesus took my place. The next letter is E. We're on gospel letter E. Everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. This says that there's an action that we need to take. It's not quite enough to just know that God is real. It's not enough to mentally assent that Jesus died for me. That is part of it, and it's a big part of it, to believe that. But the Bible talks about it more as an experiential action, that that we, in a sense, put our trust in the Lord, that we have to actually take a step of faith. I heard about a father who was hiking out with his son, and they were having a great time together. 
But as little boys will, they, he was running this way and that way. And his, his father just kept hiking along. And before long, he, was, he, he, he had climbed up to this giant rock. And he said, hey, dad, catch me. And his dad turned around. And to his surprise and shock, he saw his son hurtling in the air, yelling, dad, catch me. His arms were wide open. His legs were spread eagle. And his dad was horrified because his son was flinging himself on him. And he only had one choice, of course. He grew up and he grabbed his son in the air, pulled him down safely, and it was all good. Anyone who's had sons know this is a real life story. This is what boys do. And he just expected his dad to catch him. So he asked him, he said, why did you do that? And he said, well, because you're my dad. And that's a little bit of a picture of what it is to receive Christ, that we, in a sense, jump into the arms of the Savior knowing that he'll catch us and bring us, of course, to the loving Heavenly Father. We have to take an action step of faith. This is just not a mental ascent. This is not head knowledge. This is not knowing Bible trivia. This This is not just about learning things, although learning things can be extremely important. This is about trusting in Jesus Christ alone for eternal life. Romans 10, 13 says it this way. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. Very short and sweet. It it really is that simple. Calling on the name of the Lord means I I believe in him. I trust in him. I'm accepting Jesus' sacrifice on my behalf. I'm I'm confessing that I'm a sinner. I I acknowledge that I've broken God's commandments and I want him to take my sin away, but I'm also wanting to return to that relationship with the Heavenly Father that I can only have through the Son. All of that is, is, is bound up right here in this one verse and you know what the best part about salvation is it's a free gift ephesians 2 8 and 9 for it is by grace you have been saved through faith this is not from yourselves it is the gift of god it's not by works so that no one can boast so we've already talked about how there's no good deed there's no good work that can save you or get you closer to god it's a free gift it's a grace it, it's only by god's gift to us that we simply receive an action step of faith and trust that we're able to enter into the family of God, which then means we are forgiven, we're saved, we're set free. Our job is to simply receive it. My favorite coffee shop last week had a BOGO sale, you know, buy one, get one free. And they were doing that on one day and I happened to notice it on Facebook. I said, oh, okay, they're having a buy one, get one free. So. I texted my friend Bill and I said, you know what, do you want to get coffee? And uh, he said, yes. And I said, you know what, I'm a big spender. I'm going to pay for yours. And so when we got to the store, (laughs) he was surprised because I was actually just paying for mine because his was free. So (laughs) I didn't actually have to pay for his. Now, when there's a BOGO sale or when a store is giving away something free, in a sense, it's free for everyone. Everyone gets a free coffee like that. That's the claim. If if there's a free coffee, there's a free coffee. Everyone gets a free coffee. But practically speaking, only someone who actually goes to the store and says, yes, I will take that free coffee, receives the free coffee. And even though God's grace is free and even though salvation is a gift and even though there's no works required and even though it's for everyone, there's still an action step. I I still have to go to God to receive it. I still have to say yes to God in my spirit. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I still have to believe in him. I still have to follow him. So even though it's free, there's still an action step. And that's how grace and salvation works. But the other part of grace, just because it's free, doesn't mean I deserve it. In fact, in the word grace is this idea that we get not what we deserve, but what we don't deserve. We deserve death, but Jesus takes our place and gives us life. We deserve to be condemned, but God through Christ and receiving him says, you're not condemned. We deserve judgment, but God through Christ and receiving him says, not guilty. Several years ago now, when I first moved to North Carolina and uh, we were just getting the lay of the land, we had just moved into our new house. It was the f- literally the first week we were here. I didn't know 
the, the geography and I certainly didn't know where the schools were and I was zipping in my minivan to and from the hardware store to pick up some stuff from the house on a Saturday and I remember just trying to you know just trying to get there and back and I didn't know that I was in a school zone and as you, as you can imagine the speed limit just abruptly changed and here I am driving 50 miles an hour well I got pulled over yes that's right your pastor he's terrible and he got pulled over broke the law and what was worse is when I looked up to see the police officer I was so embarrassed because it was someone from our church and I had already met him several times and I knew he knew who I was and I hadn't even preached my first sermon yet and here he is pulling me over and I was just mortified and he's coming over he doesn't know who he's pulled over but as he comes over with his little pad and he's walking over to probably to give me a ticket, he, th he looks up and he makes eye contact and I see this big grin come over his face. <laughs> and then he says, Rob, 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 what am I going to do with you? And I still remember, I said, you know what? I'll be honest, you should give me a ticket because I deserve it. I was speeding in a school zone. That's serious. Like, just give me a ticket. And uh, he was merciful and he ended up letting me off with a warning because he understood that I had just moved in and I didn't I didn't know my way around uh, lousy excuse I know but that's that's the excuse that I had well in that is a glimpse of God's grace and mercy I definitely deserve to get a ticket but instead I am declared not guilty I, I, I'm let off I am I am n I am not guilty I am set free if you will to keep driving and Jesus says, even though you're guilty, and you are guilty, so am I, we are sinners, we're also saved by his grace. We're declared not guilty. We're declared justified. We're declared righteous before God. And this is important if you're a Christian because you don't have to live as guilty anymore. You don't have to live ashamed anymore. You can say, no, 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 Satan, you just get behind me because I'm set free. I I'm clean. And I am righteous before God. When he sees you as a Christian, he only sees his son, Jesus. And he sees the cross. He sees his blood shed for all of your sins. He sees you declared righteous. And that's the wonderful, wonderful news of the gospel. And then the third and final letter of, of the gospel is the L, which is life with Jesus starts now and last forever. Life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. You know, when people talk about salvation, whenever I've heard the gospel preached or talked about or shared, I hear a lot about heaven. And that's a good thing. Heaven is going to be great. The Bible describes heaven as a place of bliss and joy and there's no sorrow, there's no crying, there's no shame, there's no more sins, there's no more struggle, there's no more physical afflictions. And everything is going to be set right. We're only going to have peace in the presence of God himself. And we're not going to get bored. There's going to be purpose. We're going to know each other. We're still going to have relationships. I mean, there's just so many amazing things. You could talk about heaven for a long time. And that's good. But I think one thing that we often miss in the gospel and in our lives is that Jesus doesn't just promise a heaven that's way out there. and It's hard, abstract. It's hard to even picture. He promises eternal life right now. That's the promise of the gospel. Uh, in John 10:10, 10, 10, he's talking to his disciples and Jesus says the thief, that is the devil, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I come that they may have life and have it to the full. He says, my sheep, my people, those who hear my voice and follow me, Christians, they're going to find life abundant, and he always says it in the present tense, in the here and now. Your eternal life actually starts as soon as you accept Christ. Your soul is regenerated. You are going to live forever. And even though this life isn't always going to be great, this side of heaven, doesn't mean we're going to not have any pain or any problems. Of course, we're going to have trials and tribulations. God promises those too. But when you except Christ, your life is going to change in dramatic ways. He's going to add the things that really matter. He's going to bring into your life a tremendous sense of peace. He's going to bring a different capacity to love. He's going to bring a different capacity to joy and all the fruits of the Spirit. And little by little, we start to become more like Christ and we find ourselves having better relationships with other people 
and a right relationship with our Creator. When you're in Christ, the Bible says you're born all over again. You're a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come immediately. You're already set for eternal life. This is such amazing news. I came across this forum this past week on the website Quora. Quora is, a, uh, if you don't know, it's an online community where people ask questions of the community and they answer them in a very honest and open way. And what struck me was the question itself. It, it actually got me so sad because the guy asked this, why am I so bored with life? I feel like I am just waiting to die. Why? That's a simple question. Why? And so many people in our world today are asking similar questions. What's the purpose of this life? Why even go on? I'm just bored of everything. I, I, don't, I don't find it fulfilling anymore. What, what, what should I do about it? It's implied here. And there's real heartbreak here. I, I really felt for this person, even though I obviously never met him before. And when I read down through some of the answers, they didn't get much better. Someone offered, maybe try taking dancing classes, making pottery, or what you have never tried in your life. And while good intention and, boy, you're right, dance classes and pottery could be a lot of fun, uh, that's not going to scratch the itch that this guy has. Not deep down. It, it, might, it might put a Band-Aid on it for a little while. But deep down, he's asking something much more profound, is why is my soul so troubled? Why, why is my heart so heavy? Why have I not found purpose? And what he's really looking for is eternal life through Christ. And he hasn't found it, and he doesn't know. Another person said, listen to music. If you don't enjoy the song, try a different musical genre. And I thought, oh, again, music is fantastic, a gift from God. It can really lift our spirits. I can see he's trying to help, but that's going to be a band-aid too. When the song is over, He's still going to be bored and purposeless and feeling like, why am I even going on? Another one simply said, yeah, me too, dude. Just total agreement to what he said. Another one said, everyone has this feeling, dear. You will try to fill it and it will only get bigger. Another one said, fake a little smile for yourself and see if anything changes inside. And then finally, this one just brought tears to my own eyes when I read it. Everyone is just waiting to die. It could happen today, tomorrow, none of us know, except it will happen someday. Life can be so bad that we wish for death. The sooner the better. And as I read down through this, literally with tears in my eyes, I thought, this is the tragic condition of the human race. This is life in the bad news. This is life before you meet Jesus. But you don't have to sit around waiting to die. God says, I can make your life brand new. I think some people put off becoming a Christian because they think, oh, my life isn't going to be better. It's probably going to be worse. And I won't be able to do all the fun things that I like to do. I won't be able to party and I won't be able to do this and that. So they put it off and they think, well, but someday I want to go to heaven. So I'll call on Jesus on my deathbed and then I'll go to heaven. Of course, there's two problems with that. One, you never know when you're going to die. Could be tonight, God forbid, or it could be many years from now. But the other problem is, Jesus promises abundant and fulfilling life now. By putting off his offer of eternal life, we miss out on this life. We miss out on the joy in the presence of God and having a relationship with him. And that's what we've been talking about for two weeks. That's this, the G-O-S-P-E-L. That's the gospel message. That's the good news of Christ, that he comes to redeem his people, to give us life eternal right now, to give us fulfillment in every possible way. I've known that. Many people listening have known that. And I hope you know that too. Uh, hopefully this works through Facebook, but we're going to show you a video now to, to close this message. Uh, sometimes uh, these, these videos don't work online, but I hope it does. Uh, this is from Dare to Share Ministry. It's just a great way to, to cap off this gospel message, just to reiterate the, the, the six words and the six sentences in a fun, fresh, spoken word way. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, and I hope that you uh, go out and share this with many other people. It's the full story of life crushed into four minutes. The entirety of humanity in the palm of your hand crushed into one sentence. 
Listen, it's intense, right? God, our sins, paying everyone life. The greatest story ever told that's hardly ever told, God. Yes, God, the maker and giver of life. And by life, I mean any and all manner and substance, seen and unseen, what can and can be touched, thoughts, image, emotions, love, atoms, and oceans, God. All of it is handiwork, one of which is masterpiece, made so uniquely that angels look curiously. The one thing in creation that was made with his imagery, the concept so cold, it's the reason I stay bold, how God breathed in a man and he became a living soul. Formed with the intent of being infinitely, intimately fond, creator and creation held an eternal bond. And it was placed in perfect paradise till something went wrong and species got deceived and started lusting for his job and odd list of complaints as if the system ain't working and used that same breath he graciously gave us to curse him. And that sin seed spread through our soul's genome. And by nature of your nature, your species, you participated in the mutiny, our, yes, our sins. It's nature inherited, black in the human heart. It was over before it started. Deceived from day one and led away by our own lust. There's not a religion in the world that doesn't agree that something's wrong with us. The question is, what is it? And how do we fix it? Are we eternally separated from a God that may or may not have existed? But that's another subject. Let's keep grinding besides trying to prove God is like defending a lion, homie. It don't need your help. Just unlock the cage. Let's move on on how our debt can be paid. Short and sweet. The problem is sin. Yes, sin. It's a cancer, an asthma choking out our life force, forcing separation from a perfect and holy God. And the only way to get back is to get back to perfection, but silly us. Trying to pass the course of life without referring to a syllabus. This is us. Keep up your good deeds. Chant, pray, meditate. But all of that, of course, is spraying cologne on a corpse. Or you could choose to ignore it as if something don't stink. It's like stepping in dog poop and refusing to wipe your shoe, but all of that ends with how good is good enough. Take your silly list of good deeds and line them up against perfection, good luck. That's life past your pay grade. The cost of your soul, you ain't got a big enough piggy bank, but you could give it a shot. But I suggest you throw away the list, cause even your good acts are an extension of your selfishness. But here's where it gets interesting. I hope you're closely listening. Please don't get it twisted. It's what makes our faith unique. Here's what God says is part A of the gospel. You can't fix yourself. Quit trying, it's impossible. Sin brings death. Give God his breath back, you owe him. Eternally separated, and the only way to fix it is someone die in your place, and that someone gotta be perfect, or the payment ain't permanent. So if and when you find a perfect person, get him or her to willingly trade their perfection for your sin and death in. Clearly, since the only one that can meet God's criteria is God, God sent himself as Jesus to pay the cost for us. His righteousness. His death functions as payment. Yes, payment. Wrote a check with his life, but at the resurrection we all cheered because that means the check cleared. Pierced feet, pierced hands, blood-stained son of man, fullness, forgiveness, free passage into the promised land. That same breath that God breathed into us, God gave up to redeem us. And anyone and everyone, and by everyone I mean everyone, who puts their faith and trust in Him, and Him alone can stand in full confidence of God's forgiveness. And here's what the promise is, that you are guaranteed full access to return to perfect unity by simply believing in Christ and Christ alone. You are receiving life. Yes, life. This is the gospel. God, our sins, paying everyone life. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening all the way to the end. Have a great week. Join us next week. If you can, in person, football Sunday. It's going to be great. Wear your jerseys, get some great food, and we're going to have a great time together. Have a great week.